Welcome to Circa. In this Skint episode for New York City, we are going to tell you about a lot of places, events, and activities that won't break the bank. This place can be expensive, but there's a lot you can do here with little or no money. And don't worry, there are maps, notes, and info on the places mentioned in these guides in the Circa app. So whether you're in New York or would just like to start planning your budget for a jaunt to the Big Apple, you're in the right place. This is what we do. So just sit back, put your headphones on, and enjoy the ride. Put away your credit card, grab a few bucks, and off we go. Circa. Love the world you live in, and we'll help you explore it. It's a city for the rich and the young, they say. So how do you account for that spendthrift grandma walking past you up the subway steps who's 90 years old and looks like she was born for this? Or the millions of people who make nowhere near a million living and eating and working here? Rent control. Oh, right. Let's not mince our meat. New York is expensive. If you come with any money, you will spend it. This city will sniff you out and convince you to buy that $8 latte with the $8 cream puffs when you aren't even hungry and you already had way too much coffee. But not only is experiencing New York on a tight budget doable, sometimes there are things that reveal themselves that are even better than if you just had the option to be at the front of the line. There's always something happening somewhere here that's free. And if you are too busy paying for things, you might miss them. A book reading, a concert, a museum, a lecture, a tour. New York City even has a guide, updated daily with free things to do. Check it out in the guide notes. Just now when I looked it up, there was a tour of Brooklyn's amazing Greenwood Cemetery and a Lesbo A Go Go show at the Stonewall Inn. Something for everyone. I like to say, things are getting pricier and pricier. But every day here is priceless. So let's talk about some things that might not pop up in your Google search, but are totally New York. The art of people watching. The cheapest thrill in New York is getting to listen in on and witness the crazy everyday life around you. Yes, while this is true anywhere you go, just taking in what's happening right next to you is often the richest broth for any other thing you throw in the soup. New York has a particular way of both respecting boundaries and stepping right through them to make everything its business. Here, you'll hear strangers talking about the weather like it's religion. You'll get unsolicited advice about your hair from bald men. Catch wisdom from little kids with more poise than politicians talking about the future. Watch dogs be given a better life than 85% of the world. You'll say one comment to a stranger and suddenly be showered in high fives and hugs like it's your long lost cousin. Or be told to F yourself like you are the wrong guy in the mob movie. So how do you walk that line? How do you not be too intrusive, a voyeur, or feel like you are in some strange Hitchcock film? While you might not want to gawk or intrude upon something that's not yours, sometimes entering the conversation is what offers entry into another world. My biggest advice, just listen. Find a coffee shop or deli that looks out onto a busy street. Buy a small coffee and nurse it slowly. This isn't about coffee. It's about people. Don't look at your phone. Just look out at the people walking by. Or take the subway. Anywhere. Or sit at the end of the bar 
or go sit on a bench at a park and just watch. Washington Square Park is especially great for this. Watch the street performers and the tourists and the commuters zipping across. Watch the nutso squirrels hustling like the rest of us and the pigeons frantically pecking at all the crumbs. Just listen. Slow your expectations. At first, it might feel like exercising a muscle. You might be restless, bored. You might feel the itch to check your phone. Don't. Keep listening. Something will begin to open, trust me. People might begin to engage with you more. Maybe with just nods and waves and eye contact. Then even in ways you'd rather them not. Don't worry. You're not obligated to keep your curiosity shutters open if you don't want to. But it's like falling in love. Sometimes you have to risk the reach. Remember, New York is like origami. The paper doesn't make the crane. You do. Lastly, some common sense about people watching. If it's an intimate argument or conversation, be your best self and don't give it your full eyes or any spoken advice. Everyone who lives here has at one time or another had an unfortunate heated conversation in public. It's embarrassing enough to not have to share it with the prying eyes of the multitudes. But if it's a conversation about the weather, the city, sports, TV, art, food, I'd say fair game. Through your feet. If all you did was walk New York and eat street food, you'd do just fine here. So without any further ado, let's take a stab at both and take a walk through Chinatown. One of the first and largest Chinatowns in the U.S., Manhattan's Chinatown has been surpassed in size by the newer Chinatowns across the river in Queens and Brooklyn. But the density and history of this original Chinatown still makes it one of the best places to explore, especially on foot. Chinatown, mostly untouched by gentrification for the last 25 years, has finally succumbed to the trend. And now you can get your boutique dim sum with $18 cocktails adorned with yuzu salted rims. But one smell out of the subway and you know it's still Chinatown, where, especially in the day, it's packed as ever with an olfactory overload that makes the word umami feel like some boring cousin. Start by taking the BD train to Grand Street, right into the bustle of the fruit and vegetable markets. Here, you'll find Asian pears as big as melons, grapes, mandarins, boiled peanuts, sticky rice wrapped in banana leaves. You'll hear the commotion of the marketplace immediately, something you can't get on Amazon or even at a grocery store. Walk down Christie Street toward the Manhattan Bridge. To fortify your walk with a proper plastic fork lunch, stop at Wa Fong No. 1 Fast Food. Grab your roast pork, chicken or duck, barbecued perfectly, cleavered right there in front of you on a giant chopping block, served hot over rice and cabbage for less than an oat milk latte. Admittedly, prices have skyrocketed in the last year everywhere, including here. But the crazy thing is that it's still probably less than that latte. You can walk Mott Street south into the thick of the curved and packed sidewalk, lined with restaurants and health shops with wisdom older than the word medicine. Marvel at the marketplace of everything. Designer bag ripoffs, shiny medallions to welcome the new year, cheap t-shirts, dried mushrooms. You should know just one block west is Mulberry Street, where you'll find the now very literal little Italy with cheesy waiters looking to fold you into their establishments like a calzone they've made a million times. Little Italy still has some gems and its own charm if you want to take a gander while you're here. This used to be the Italian neighborhood, with grocers on every corner and carts shucking fresh clams right atop the cobblestones, back when Little Italy was big. 
because when 40 million Italians came to America in the span of 40 years around the turn of the century, a whole lot of them never made it past New York. This is where they ended up. But unlike Chinatown, which still houses more Chinese in density than anywhere else in the city, no Italians live here anymore. They all moved to Staten Island or Brooklyn decades ago. Now, there's just a handful of old shops like De Palos, an Italian cheese shop right out of a storybook. It's still a must-see establishment, so take the detour to wander over and enjoy the immaculate hanging hams and tire wheels of Parmigiano and the old feel vibe before making your way back to the rows of glazed ducks in the windows of Chinatown. If you take Mott Street all the way past Canal, you'll eventually end up in Chatham Square, off the busy Bowery near Manhattan Bridge. Give a nod to the Confucius statue and the pigeons who tend to gravitate to all the pickings of the noodles and crumbs around. This is a very different Chinatown than 100 years ago, when exoticism and racism towards immigrants attracted hotspots of crime, rivaling gangs, and opium dens. Off Chatham Square, you'll find Doyer Street that bends and curves like a river, a rarity in Manhattan. Once the most dangerous street in America, Doyer Street was known as the Bloody Angle because from one side, you couldn't see the other, making it a great place to ambush when gangs battled for their turf. Up until recently, you could still get skeeved out walking in an underground passage of reflexology shops and flickering fluorescent lights that connected Chatham Square to Doyer Street. Only half of the underground passage remains, recently renovated for chic new restaurants with those $18 cocktails. These days, they've painted a large mural over the curved road in bright colors and tourists line the streets, flocking to No Moi Tea Parlor, the longest running restaurant in Chinatown. They've been serving dim sum for over 100 years and pouring brown oolong from metal pots into quaint plastic cups for probably the last 50. It used to be funky enough for you to be the only patrons on a rainy day, but word got out and now there's often a line down the street where hosts check you in with their iPads, which kind of kills the historic vibe. Just goes to show, nothing lasts. Even the crappy things. But not everything's been smoothed over. Find your way to Moscow or Bayard Street and let it lead you right into Columbus Park, which seemingly remains untouched by Instagram and is one of my favorite places to people watch. Also, in case you passed up the first cheap eat, you can always kill your dumpling craving at the tiny fried dumpling hole in the wall, where 15 juicy morsels will still only set you back five bucks. At Columbus Park, you'll still find older Chinese men and women playing mahjong and doing tai chi. It's one of the best parks to enter a time warp. You could almost believe that people have been playing mahjong there forever. But if we dig a little deeper, we'll find a whole other history below. This spot used to be part of the infamous Five Points, in its day one of the most notoriously dangerous places in all the world. So take a seat on your park bench, open up your dumplings, and let's take a moment to delve back into New York City in the 20s. The 1820s. Where you are sitting in Columbus Park once sat atop a rather picturesque pond where New York City got most of its fresh drinking water from. But humans, being as industrious as they are, polluted the hell out of it pretty immediately, and it was drained and filled in to make way for middle-class establishments. Of course, you can't just pour land over a fresh spring pond and think it will be fine and dandy. Buildings soon began to cave and sewage abounded in the streets. The middle class fled, and immigrants, or those without any other options, remained. By the mid-1800s, people had been pouring in from everywhere for the last 50 years. Most notably Irish fleeing from the Great Famine, Italians looking for opportunity, and free blacks. People from desperate times and desperate places came only to find things worse than ever. Murder was commonplace, as was disease and downright squalor. People shacked up sometimes 12 to a room. Corruption was rife. Gangs owned the streets. This is the actual Gangs of New York land. And if you want to know what it was like, I'd check out some of Jacob Reese's photos, which we'll touch on later. 
Yet, this is also where the idea of a melting pot came from. Crank the furnace hot enough, put it all together, and cultures fuse and create together. Emancipated blacks and poor Irish lived together in an integration first of its kind. Tap dance was born. Street food thrived. But it's also where an Irish mob ransacked the black church, and nativist Protestants and Catholics pummeled each other. Fun times. This goes to show you that democracy is not an ideal written on parchment. It's a lived experience that comes from necessity, and it's often messy in its making. Isn't that always how it is? When you get down to it, almost everything that exists of beauty comes from some sort of struggle, exploitation, or tension. The lucky people who live now in Manhattan's fancy Soho lofts or Brooklyn's bougie brownstones for hardly any rent usually didn't get there by cashing in their trust funds. They might have spent years without running water, in unsafe conditions, or eating beans right out of the can. So, lest we romanticize the days of old, New York in the 1800s sounds pretty awful. Violence, disease, poverty, desperation. And yet, that's what paved the way right under your feet, in Little Italy and Chinatown, for all its diversity and abundance. Cheese shops and roast duck included. A walk around the cloisters. What sometimes feels like Manhattan's secret museum, the Cloisters is tucked up high on a hill at the top of the borough in Inwood. Going there can feel as if you stepped off the train into another century on another continent. A monastery-like reverie of medieval art with gorgeous covered walkways literally imported from 14th century France and preserved gardens in the traditions of Charlemagne, the Cloisters is one of the sweeter places to spend an afternoon. The only hitch is that, as part of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, it's no longer free if you are not a resident of New York. But the real gift of the Cloisters is the walk to it and around it. Nestled within Fort Tyron Park, one of the most underrated parks in the city, it's well worth a train ride. Over 60 acres of winding steep paths, gorgeous views, and arched bridges, the park feels far away from anything else in the city. It will almost make you hate everything that makes New York, New York. High-rise buildings, endless shops, noise, activity, people. Because it's one of the only places still in the city where you can look out over the Hudson River and see the raw, timeless bluffs of natural beauty that used to be much of the landscape. That's because when Rockefeller bought the estate and museum and built Fort Tyron Park, he also made sure to buy the Palisades in New Jersey across the Hudson, so that the views would be unadorned by future industries of progress, aka endless ugly development, in perpetuity. The result? A little Catskills right here in Manhattan. It is especially magical in the fall, when the air is crisp and the colors fall like pages of a children's book. If you live somewhere with abundant nature and pristine horizons, this might not do it for you. But for New Yorkers who pay exorbitant rents to live looking out windows that are so close to other buildings you could literally step across with only slivers of real sunlight or fresh air, the area around the cloisters is like our own little Hogwarts without Malfoy. The beach. The ultimate democratizer. The original playground. Beaches are special anywhere in the world, and New York City is no different. It's one of New York's golden perks that doesn't get talked about much by travel guides and iconic films. This isn't Los Angeles or Miami, and certainly not Hawaii, with pristine sand and dolphins frolicking near the shore. But just remember, New York City is mostly made up of islands flanked all around by a large, salty body of water otherwise known as the Atlantic Ocean. And sure, 
Like everywhere else in the city, the beaches can be loud, dirty, and crowded. But partly, that's why they're magic. In the interminable New York heat of summer, when the air is thicker than cream and you can hardly think no matter how strong your iced coffee is, dipping into a body of water more massive than the city itself is one of the only ways to bring the temperature down. And it's free, which means everyone, and I mean everyone, is there. And luckily, when it comes to the beach, you have options. You can jump on the Purple Rockaway Line ferry down to Jacob Reese Park with its sprawling boardwalk stocked with brick oven pizza and craft coffee and a beautiful long shore hugging the beginning of the far Rockaways. Nicknamed the People's Beach, it brings everyone out. Families who make six figures, broke hipsters, old school New Yorkers who have been coming there since before the internet, queers and fairies and topless newly transitioned trans folks showing off their scars, here, summer will be in high tilt, and there will be plenty to feast your eyes on when it comes to people watching. Also, a bit of history about the place. Unlike most spots named after rich people that owned everything and wanted their legacies cemented into buildings, Jacob Rees is an icon worth celebrating. Known as a muckraker journalist, a group of socially-minded writers and photographers who exposed corruption and the plight of the working class and poor, Jacob Rees is often remembered for his haunting photographs of New York's tenements and slums of the late 1880s and early 1900s. Because once you see something, it's harder to ignore it. What a great legacy for a public beach that sits like a gateway into the soup of the city. Near Rees Park, with all its bustle and boardwalk, there's another world, Fort Tilden Beach. Nestled into what is now a bird sanctuary, and what once was, all up until the 70s, a military-stocked fort, Tilden is quieter and a bit of a trek. But it's only a 30-minute walk from Reese, and if you pack light, it's worth the walk. Just know, unlike most other beaches, there are no facilities. There's also no official swimming allowed at Fort Tilden Beach, but that hasn't stopped anyone ever, has it? Then there's the classic New York beach experience you might not think of when it comes to actually swimming in the ocean. Coney Island, America's original amusement park. With its famous Nathan's hot dogs, seedy Mermaid Avenue history, and the one and only 100-year-old wooden cyclone roller coaster. A ride that will give you a chiropractic adjustment or make you need one. You may have heard of Coney Island before, but its story is like a trashy treasure trove treat in the Cracker Jack box of history. Long before people had cars and could leave the city or jump on the nearest flight to a weekend warm getaway, Coney Island was everyone's place to be. Begun way back in the mid 1800s as a resort destination, Coney quickly earned a place of reverence, beckoning the city's elite along the Prospect Park rail line. But by the 20s, with the subways fully operating and three of them ending there, Coney Island became the refuge of the working class. Thousands of people would descend on Coney like teens to TikTok, to swim at the beach, eat hot dogs and funnel cakes, and see the many amusements unlike anywhere in the world. And unlike much of the attractions of the past, this is where men and women, rich and poor, commingled in their time off. Amusement parks were all the rage, and they were all at Coney Island. This is where Buffalo Bill took his wild rides, and Houdini became a household name. It's here you could see live elephants perform for peanuts, or feast your curiosities at the freak show of medical anomalies and kid contortionists, things that would never be allowed today. But nothing beat the new phenomena called roller coasters. Long before Disneyland, people would come to Coney Island to travel to the moon with ice machines and mermaids, or be swept upside down with only physics keeping them in their seats. It's as if all the brightest minds in Silicon Valley making apps today were making amusement rides and experiences. All the cutting-edge newfangled technology could be tested on the masses. And only a few people died, which is actually kind of amazing. And of course, it wasn't just the Ferris wheel that had people swooning. Gambling, burlesque, dark corners and side streets that elicited sordid behavior and reveled in its mischief. Basically, 
seedy, saucy fun times. But then came fires, and World War II, and Trump Sr., and the 70s. Though nothing took the cake as much as Robert Moses, the grand architect of much of New York's unfortunate urban planning, who thought the place cheap and sought to raise its wonders to put up housing projects and clean up its fun. He famously placed signs forbidding almost everything, including no peddling, no dogs, no bicycling, no roller skating, no newspapers other than for reading, no sitting on the steps, no bathing rafts, no kites, basically no more Coney Island fun. And then Fred Trump, yes, the father of that other guy, stepped in and tried to rezone the whole place to just be apartments. Let's just say things weren't looking good for the beachy wonderland. But somehow, Coney Island survived. Almost completely destroyed many times, by fires, greed, bureaucracy, or decline, Coney Island continues holding on to its wonder wheel like an inflatable life ring, with a revitalized boardwalk and plenty of commingled crowds. Get yourself there on a busy weekend, and you might find yourself sweating it out at one of the weekly boardwalk dance parties, or dancing salsa among Puerto Rican men fishing and playing dominoes at the same time. Or start off the year with a splash and join the thousands of us that go running into the ice cold waters to begin the year. There's no better way to know you are alive than to feel like you are about to die. Just make sure you stick around to dance on the boardwalk until the feeling in your toes comes back. Coney Island is iconic for a reason. And like most things besides crack and cruelty, you should try it at least once. But for a slice of something entirely different, and my personal favorite, you have to go to Brighton Beach, just down from Coney at the southern end of Brooklyn. A stronghold of Russian, Ukrainian, and Slavic immigrants since forever, here you'll find every kind and age of body wearing barely more than loincloths. Bellies that belie physics. Banana hammocks. It's all here. Women in their 80s will swim by you in their swimming visors like a Sunday walk in the park, flaunting folds of well-oiled skin that have seen a thousand suns, while teenagers who forgot their swimsuits will be taunting each other in their wet clothes, showing off their new tattoos through their soaked t-shirts. You'll see old men smoking cigars, surely once in the mob, if not still, playing with their grandkids, and new Brooklynites vaping and singing to their little stereos. There's no body shame here. Wear your six-pack or keg proudly. No paparazzi will be around to snap photos, and most likely the gossip you hear from the Slavic women around you won't be about you. Brighton Beach, although not as iconic or pretty as some of the other beaches I mentioned, is a world unto itself, and yet still totally New York City. Unlike almost anything else in the city, it can be a whole day's entertainment for under 10 bucks. And considering the world stage lately, having Ukrainians and Russians living side by side as neighbors is worth more than ever. To get there, take the BQ train south all the way to the Brighton Beach stop and head to Brighton Bazaar for a salty snack of smoked fish or seeded pastry. Perhaps a deli pint of garlicky, half-sour pickles that will ward off any evil spirits or beachgoers who come too close. The giant, amazing Tashkent supermarket across the street, which we go into detail about in our extras section of New York's Start Here episode, has taken a lot of their business in recent years, and for good reason. It's a god among prepared foods, and it's worth the visit just to marvel at the mounds of octopus salad and tender lamb shank but the Brooklyn Bazaar holds down an old vibe, even a slightly sad one. There's something about paying homage to the vestiges of old. And unlike Tashkent, which is Uzbeki Muslim, here you can get beers. So grab yourself a few cheap and delicious, crisp Eastern European brews to sneak onto the sand once the salt is drawing on you after your midday dip. And if you have kids, or don't do alcohol, try the delicious bread kvass beverage, made from fermented rye bread and sugar. It's bubbly and beautiful. Now head to the beach, across the charming old wooden boardwalk, 
and towards the salty blue. It gets packed in the summer, but there's always room at the beach to carve your spot and stick your umbrella in the hot sand like a flag on your own moon voyage. The water at Brighton Beach is almost always calm, making it great for those shy of big waves, or for kids. And although the beach can sometimes get littered in high summer, the sea these days stays relatively clean, an amazing feat for a giant free city beach. The beach officially closes at 6 p.m., and some rangers will drive by to whistle everyone out of the water. But wait 10 minutes, and everyone jumps back in, especially in July, when 6 p.m. can still be hot as blazes, and it doesn't get dark until 9. Plus, where else would anyone tell you to make sure you don't miss the public restroom? Well, the woman's side, at least. Sorry, gents, you'll have to take my word for it, though maybe it evens out all those times we have to join a long, snaking line of squirming ladies needing to pee when you just walk right in. For all those who identify as women, check out Comfort Station Number 2, the large restroom located right off the boardwalk that has a curved bell roof and looks like a grand pavilion dropped by accident onto the sand. The entrance is filled with large pots of plants, and when you enter, loud, classic, slow jams will greet you any time of the year. Inside, there are laminated axioms of life advice, pictures of inspiring figures and memorials for those from the neighborhood that have passed. Near the holidays, there are Christmas and Hanukkah decorations, Valentine gets properly cheesed up, and otherwise there are pinwheels of fake silk flowers and salty sand all over the floor from the many beachgoers. This is kitsch at its finest. Being able to relieve oneself should be a free and human right, and it can be surprisingly hard to find access in the midst of this city. But to feel inspired by a bathroom? That's something else altogether. Plus, I dare you to find it in any other guide. When you're done with the beach and feeling peckish, as you tickle out the last of the sand between your toes and plan your evening, Head over for stellar fare at Kashkar Cafe, serving Uyghur halal food, where you can get hand-pulled noodles called langman with tender spiced pungent lamb, one of the best meals in the city, for cheap-ish. Just another example of being able to celebrate a culture that is currently in political turmoil through your taste buds. Uyghur Muslims are presently being persecuted in their homeland in northwestern China and having places to support them can be a subtle act of resistance. Community Gardens. Speaking of resistance, I want to tell you a little story about some of my favorite places in New York. Say it's a beautiful day and you're walking through the East Village in Manhattan. Flanked between two buildings, amid the trash and pigeon poop and graffitied bodegas, you notice a little patch of verdant paradise behind the fence. There's a gazebo and a group of old-timers chatting away. Kids are playing tag. A willow tree sways around itself. Before you wonder if your bubble tea was laced with some weird-ass Willy Wonka balls, the gate is cracked open and someone beckons you in, welcomes you. Welcome to one of the city's over 600 community gardens. Of course, as a running theme of our historical forays into New York, it wasn't always so picturesque. Community gardens are icons of resilience and even more so, transformation. When New York City did an economic nosedive in the late 60s, a lot of buildings fell into disrepair and burned down or were abandoned by their owners. Heroin and crack were rampant. Crime, trash, concrete, and worse pervaded the lots left empty. The city often looked the other way. But also often, a group of neighbors would get together and decide to take back their block clearing and cleaning the vacant spaces and turning them into their own gardens. To grow food, have somewhere to gather, and to help transform their communities back into neighborhoods. Then came the 90s, when Mayor Rudolph Giuliani, yeah, that guy, 
realized a lot of these gardens were on prime real estate and officially owned by the city. He started to illegally raise many of them to sell off to developers. This prompted a movement to save and protect the remaining gardens throughout the city. A movement that lasts till this day. Community gardens serve a different purpose than parks. In Manhattan especially, a borough where hardly anyone has a backyard, they provide a sense of place that doesn't need a transaction to enjoy. A place that's smaller and more intimate. Somewhere to build something with your own hands, have meetings with your neighbors, even grow your own tomato. Although they are all over New York, the best place to see and experience community gardens is in the deep East Village, otherwise known as Loe Saida. Sometimes two on a block, each one is a world unto itself, with its own personality. Some have member plots where people grow food. Others have elaborate stages and art. Some are tended like English tea gardens. Others are left wild. But all are grown, maintained, and stewarded by people in the neighborhood that get keys and help to collectively take care of the place. Nowadays, to be an officially protected garden by the city, you have to have some open days for the public, which is good news for the rest of us. I love walking into a community garden and listening to the neighbors gossip, sitting on handmade benches to read or listen to the birds and insects that flock to the seldom seen abundance of green in an otherwise concrete city. I love that they're not run by a park, but by people. I also love that it's the only reason I've been to jail. Yep. See, I got arrested over 20 years ago trying to save one of the gardens Giuliani bulldozed, and they threw us all into the notorious New York City tombs for the night to teach us a lesson. Except it backfired, and our famous case ended up saving 104 other gardens. I love that my longtime friend I went to jail with 20 years ago still brings me wild nettles from El Jardín del Paraíso and we make bird cookie ornaments to hang on the trees around the holidays. I love that when I visited the community Day of the Dead altar at Campos Garden, an 11-year-old who knows the place like his backyard offered me vegan hot cocoa in the misty rain. And gardens like Hattie Carthen in Brooklyn, led by plant sorcerer Yonette Fleming, often gives neighbors their first taste of lemon balm or the delightfully bright sorrel leaf and holds workshops on herbal medicine and youth programs more dynamic than anything they are getting in school. I know firsthand how a garden can make a place. So roll up your sleeves and offer to help rake a path, pull some weeds, or plant some bulbs. There's always something to do. Or just pass through and enjoy the opportunity to actually stop and smell the roses. It won't be in your tour guide as top New York City destinations for the day. But that's the point. Summer concerts and the opera, the cheap way. Okay, I admit this is only for a couple of months of the year, but if you want to do New York cheap, summer's the time to be here. Almost every night, all over the city, there's a different star-studded concert, a free film screening with a thousand people sitting around on blankets, a dance performance or party, a comedy show. Not to mention you can sit out late and cash in on the brutal, humid days for those sweet, warm nights. Not only are the summer concerts some of the best cultural programming in the city, there's an electric vibe to things that are free because they bring together everyone. Central Park has Summer Stage, there's the River to River Festival from the Hudson to the East River. Lincoln Center brings its usually gilded programming outdoors. The City Parks Foundation has a series with concerts all over Brooklyn, the Bronx, and Queens. You get the picture. But at Celebrate Brooklyn, a concert series that spans over two months of the summer with weekly programming at the Bandshell in Prospect Park, you'll find a whole new demographic every night as the show changes. Here, I've seen David Byrne, Mavis Staples, Janelle Monet, Japanese Breakfast, Kronos Quartet, Omo Sangare, Common, the list goes on. All 
for free. People bring picnics and their kids, blankets and blunts. It's so downright good vibed, you almost forget that you are in this crazy city. Whenever I feel New York isn't worth the hustle or the hype, I find my way to one of these concerts and lie down under the trees listening to music and conversation around me and feel right again in the world. Although there is food and drink available at the concerts, a small can of beer will cost you 10 bucks, so it's best to bring your own provisions. And just a heads up, I've been known to sneak in an array of delights, but they're pretty thorough with their bag checks and don't allow alcohol or glass of any kind. And for big names, you'll want to get there early to get in line and snag a seat or patch of ground. Worst case, you can sit outside the fence like hundreds of others who want to drink their own wine, but the sound is never quite as good. For picnic help, visit East Wind Snack Shop in Windsor Terrace for some delicious dumplings dry aged beef or fresh ground pork to make you swoon, or grab a free roaming rotisserie chicken at Union Market. I admit, the opera is not usually on budget lists. It's for the genteel, right? The pearls and the pumps and the patrons in their gilded age. It's not hip, and when it tries to be, it's usually a flop. Even worse, the classic operas with traditional plots that are so far off from today's politics, much less ideals, are often the best. But make no bones about it. Opera is a vocal feat of Olympic proportions. It's as over the top as drag, with better costumes than Broadway, and a full-scale live symphony at every performance. Plus, the decadence of the experience becomes almost its own farce. And guess what? You can go for cheap. So if I had to choose between all the most iconic cultural institutions for the most bang for your iconic buck, I'd say find your way to the Metropolitan Opera for cheap seats in the family circle or balcony box, where you can have your own little private alcove way up in the rafters. And then go nuts. Wear your finest frock. Hell, do a moonstruck and get a total makeover like Cher. Even paying just 30 bucks a pop, you can still mingle with the socialites, drink champagne at intermission, and feel the thrill of a hundred people in costume glory singing their hearts out about sordid and stupid things while you follow along with little subtitle captions above your seat. And at intermission, if you plan it right, you can go snag some prime seats in the orchestra that are just sitting there empty, just waiting for you to appreciate the finer view. Plus, with two giant Chagall paintings in the entrance, if you don't have time or budget for the museum, you can sneak in some massive pieces of art worthy of a long look. No matter how ridiculous the production is, when the bells chime, the lights dim, and the chandelier retreats into the ceiling, it's unmistakably a thrill. So go, delight in the bravado of operatic bravo. Just don't be late. They'll throw you in a little theater in the basement to watch the broadcast till the first intermission, which can be more than an hour. Oh, and remember, don't take it too seriously like everyone around you might. It's opera, after all. The plot will often be archetypes on steroids. That's the fun of it. <laughs> Lastly, a few tips for how to keep from blowing your budget in 10 seconds. When you travel, take the subway and not a car. You are going to save a whole lot. For the most part, alcohol in restaurants is stupid expensive here. It's not uncommon for a glass of wine to be the same price as the cost of a fancy burger. And your fancy burger, the cost of a steak, for that matter. If you really want to cut down and the weather is reasonable, make some friends, buy a bottle at a wine store, and head to a park. A note here on that, it's still illegal to drink in public in New York City, but everyone does it. And as long as you're not flaunting it, no one is going to give you grief. Or worse, a ticket. This is especially true since the pandemic. Also, if you missed our New York City Eat Here episode, there are a lot of sweet tips for what to eat that won't break the bank. So be sure to check that out too. And sure, Broadway is Broadway, but sometimes the show out on the street is just as entertaining. 
And almost all of New York museums have free days or suggested admissions. Some people hate being in a crowd to see art, but I personally love the feeling of thousands of people gathering to see paint on a wall. And when it's the difference between 25 bucks a pop and you want to go to four museums, you might just reconsider your aversion to the hoi polloi. The one museum that used to be pay-as-you-wish but has recently changed its policy to everyone except New York City residents is the Met. It's $30 for an adult. But luckily, it's worth the price of admission. Otherwise, don't sweat it if you come here a little paltry in the pockets. You'll be in good company. Just give yourself a little more time and allow yourself to be a little more adventurous. And most importantly, just make sure you brought good shoes. Thanks for listening to our Skint episode in New York City. Now that we've saved you some hard-earned cash, remember to check out the other episodes in this guide on New York theater, its eclectic food scene, doing the city with kids, and much more. Whether you're heading to New York right now, sometime in the near future, or would just like to learn all about a place I truly love, you'll get instant access to the full guide plus new episodes on a regular basis when you subscribe to Circa. Find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or download the Circa app, where you can also get pictures and maps and notes on the places in this episode and more. Maybe you'll want to sample our guides for Iceland, Barcelona, Rome, Los Angeles, and many more to come. Circa. Love the world you live in, and we'll help you explore it.